particular thing was enabled by the fact that he could make this beautiful doer and actually put things in it and see whether they became superconducting or not. Now, of course, once discoveries like this are made, it then becomes much easier for people to follow this on and do research after the fact. So once you, do, once you discover that mercury is a superconductor, it doesn't take a lot of genius to say, I should throw everything in liquid helium and figure out if it's a superconductor or not. And by about 1930, people had done precisely this. They had taken every material one could think of, they had thrown it in liquid helium, and they had figured out which temperature, if any, these materials became superconducting and forget about the x-axis on this plot we are looking at the y-axis which tells you what temperature these materials become superconducting and among the elemental metals you see niobium up there at about 9 Kelvin has among the highest superconducting transition temperatures which is the reason why niobium and compounds that contain niobium are what is used to make superconducting magnets that are used in things like MRIs Okay, so around 1930, people had gone through the periodic table, they had put everything in liquid helium, they had figured out some things are superconducting, some things are not superconducting, here were their TCs, and then people started making compounds, they said, well, we've done all the, all the elements, let's start mixing them together, let's make compounds, let's take, let's take all the compounds and put them in liquid helium, and see if those things go superconducting. And well, well here's, a, here's a partial table. This is from about 1970. I pulled up a publication. And you can see that material scientists are a very industrial bunch, industrious bunch. They, you know, you have elements. These are only... Yeah, these are only binaries, you can have ternaries, quaternaries, you can, you know, you can have lots of fun. And uh, people found that the temperature at which they became superconducting varied all over the place. So you had 18, you had 0.74, all sorts of things. I should say that this game is a game that I'm involved in even now. Even now we go to the lab, we mix stuff together, and we ask, is it superconducting? What temperature is it superconducting at, if it is? So I should say, even now, the field of superconductivity is completely wide open. Let me give you two examples. These things are called USOs. Uh, in reference to UFOs and NSOs, this is a word that I came up with, I'll, I'll explain what this is to you in a second. USOs are objects that people claim to be superconductors. So every year there will be somebody who says, well I discovered a new superconductor and it's superconducting at room temperature. So this particular one is some version of graphite. I came across this, I was at a conference and the New York Times was interviewing this person, I won't say who, who claimed that graphite when he did something to it, and it's always something strange that nobody can ever reproduce, becomes a superconductor, and in this case it's a superconductor at, at 175 degrees Kelvin, which if it were true would be mind-boggling. And um, okay, this didn't, this didn't pan out, and this is always true at any point in time, there would be people making these claims and then there would be people running to the labs to make this thing however they claim that they were going to make it and see if it's actually true. 99% of the time it turns out it's not true. The other thing also happens, so this is a very famous example, this is a compound called magnesium diboride, MgB2. So this thing was found to be a superconductor in just 2001, quite recently. And it was found that it was superconducting at a temperature of 39 Kelvin, which is extremely high for superconductors. And in fact, in modern magnets, magnesium diboride is now starting to make inroads into the magnet industry because it, it, it has such a high transition temperature. You can make magnets with magnesium diboride without using liquid helium. Now, this data is actually from about 1958. So guys had measured the specific heat, which I won't go into what the specific heat is, other than to say is when you see something like, like this in a specific heat, you say superconductor. You know that that's a superconductor. But they never plotted their data in 1958. They just wrote it down in a table. And the, the paper was published as a table and they never really plotted their data. And if, they, if you just write down all of these data points, they didn't look very carefully and see that this thing was actually superconducting there. So this is an NSO, a non-identified superconducting object. It was a superconductor. In 1958, they probably would have won a Nobel Prize for doing this. They just wrote their data. They didn't draw the graph. So now I tell all my students always draw a graph. <laughs> okay. 
So one could ask the following question. Well, this, this seems like an awfully silly way of going about doing this business. You ask your friends, you just try things, and you see if something is superconducting or not. If you're a respectable scientist,